you picture aliens on the moon? Are they tiny and peaceful or gigantic and war hungry? Maybe they have bat-like wings or ride mosquitoes the size of cars, which would honestly be disgusting. For millennia, we've looked up at the big night light in the sky and imagined the creatures that live there, from ruthless insectoids to just friendly tall people. Let's explore some of history's weird and wonderful visions of life on the moon. Hi, I'm Dr. Emily Zarka, and this is Space for Humans. Many early visions of life on the moon are grounded in spiritual beliefs. Cultures like the Maori and the Inuit saw the moon as inhabited by spirits and ancestors. For Aristotle and Plato, the moon was a heavenly body, a symbol of perfection. The Aristotelian perspective on the perfect moon dominated pretty much until Galileo looked through his telescope, but it wasn't the only theory. Ancient philosophers like Democritus hmm. speculated on whether the moon was just another inhabitable world among many. Writing in the late first century CE, Plutarch combined both perspectives. He saw the moon as a second Earth and described its visible landscape. But he also theorized that perhaps the moon was a sort of purgatory, a way station on the journey from Earth to heaven where human souls were transformed and purified, kind of like the last season of Lost. In the second century, we get the first really fun story of life on the moon. In the sci-fi work True History, satirist Lucian of Samosata describes his Silenti as humanoids with removable eyes, tails made of cabbage, and beards above their knees. They sweat milk and sneeze honey which they turn into snacks of sweet cheese, which is honestly really gross. They ride giant birds, including three-headed vultures, and enter battle on a cavalry of gigantic insects, mosquitoes and spiders, and fleas as big as 12 elephants. And that's kind of it until the invention of the telescope in the 17th century. You might think that looking more closely at the moon would make visions of lunar life less fantastical, but you'd be wrong. You see, the belief in life on the moon relied on a belief that the moon had a landscape similar to Earth's, and that was a very contentious idea. Medieval life was dominated by the Vatican's support for Aristotle's heavenly moon, not Plutarch's inhabited second Earth. The fact that we can plainly see the moon's surface was long dismissed as either a literal mirror reflection of the mountains and valleys of Earth, or just a problem with human eyesight. And that's how Galileo gets into so much trouble with his telescope. In the early 1600s, Galileo starts building really powerful telescopes that allow people to see unprecedented detail, and in 1609, he points one at the moon. His illustrations of the moon's craters and mountains, its rough and pockmarked surface, really upset followers of the perfect heavenly moon theory, like the Vatican. As recently as 1600, an astronomer named Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake in Rome for heresy, and all he did was say that the moon was probably inhabited. Confirmation that the moon had a visible landscape inspired many new visions of life on the moon. In his novel The Dream, astronomer Johannes Kepler imagines lunar beings that live underground and in caves. His aliens have adapted to the extreme heat of the moon's surface. They're gigantic, and they live short, fast lives. Kepler's work is a surprisingly scientific study of how creatures might survive on the moon. Of course, he learned from Bruno's fate and styled his work as fiction we don't talk about Bruno. Bishop Francis Godwin had a different take on life on the moon. In The Man in the Moon, an explorer named Domingo ties a bunch of swan-like birds to a craft that flies him to the moon. There he finds a utopian society of tall people who speak in tunes. It's utopian, he learns, because these lunar humans secretly swap out all of their badly behaved children for well-behaved children on Earth. So if you're wondering why your preteen is suddenly really rude, they might be from the moon. Godwin's work inspired a lot of spin Moths, both satirical and sincere. In 1638, Dr. John Wilkins published the discovery of a world in the moon. Fun fact, Wilkins was the brother-in-law to Oliver Cromwell. Yes, that Oliver Cromwell. In it, the English clergyman argues that life on the moon is not only possible, but probable. He compares the moon to the ocean. Look only at the churning waves of the surface, and you can't fathom what lies beneath. Enlightenment thinker Bernard de Fontenelle agreed. To us, the moon appears as a faraway village does to a Parisian. Is there truly life outside Paris? We, oui, if you call that living. Inspired by explorers like Walter Raleigh and Francis Drake, Wilkins designed a spacecraft with springs, feathers, and gunpowder. Less of a moonshot and more of a long shot. Among Wilkins' weirdest theories was his belief that people didn't need to eat in space because without gravity, food would just stay in their stomachs. 
Luckily, he never reached liftoff. Cyrano de Bergerac, the real one, wrote a parody of Godwin's novel in which the moon's inhabitants have four legs, speak in music, and believe that nothing is sexier on a man than, you guessed it, a really large nose. Fast forward to the 1800s, when stronger telescopes and photography allow wider and more detailed views of the moon's surface. According to an 1846 astronomy textbook, most astronomers believe that the moon is inhabited. We just don't have the technology to see it. But that didn't stop people from guessing. Bavarian astronomer Franz Gruthausen believed he'd identified a city complete with buildings and streets. British scientist Thomas Dick calculated that based on the population density of England, the moon has about 4.2 billion residents. You know, give or take. Edgar Allan Poe's short story about a trip to the moon describes its creatures as two feet tall and without ears. So maybe if they're small, you can fit in another billion. Famed astronomer William Herschel, who discovered Uranus, examined the moon through gigantic telescopes and compared its landscape of mountains and plains to the English countryside. He was convinced that this other Earth could support life. In 1835, the New York Sun Penny Press published a series of articles reporting on the discovery of creatures on the moon, humanoids with large large, bat-like wings who lived in a lush world amidst unicorns, tiny zebras, and for some reason, beavers without tails? The reports weren't real, but they inspired a lot of art imagining the Batman of the moon. Public excitement over the Great Moon Hoax also won the sun a lot of new subscribers. By the dawn of the 20th century, astronomers accepted that life on the moon was unlikely. And yet, as a 1915 astronomy textbook puts it, it may still exist in some weird form. Visions of these weird forms continue to spawn in popular culture. H.G. Wells 1901, the first men in the moon imagines the advanced civilization Selenites as insectoids. Insects again. George Melies 1902 film, A Trip to the Moon, depicts these insectoids as exploding at the touch of a punch. Melies had a background as a magician. You can see the evidence of the Cold War and Red Scare and how mid-century authors imagined lunar life. The 1965 Soviet novel Dunno on the Moon depicted an advanced civilization of ruthless capitalists. In the 1967 American novel The Moon made, the moon is dominated by a brutal communist dictatorship. Then came 1969, when audiences worldwide watched the Apollo 11 mission touch down on the lunar surface and be greeted by, well, no one. The following year, two Soviet scientists published their hypothesis that the moon is actually a spaceship created by an unknown alien intelligence. And maybe they just, you know, pretended they weren't home, which honestly seems like the smart choice. The so-called hollow moon hypothesis remains a popular conspiracy theory. Different versions imagine the moon as a spaceship or a space station. Maybe it's run by evil thought-controlling reptiles. Or maybe it was created by time-traveling humans from an advanced future. Who knows? Or maybe the moon is an egg. That's the premise of the 2014 Doctor Who episode, Kill the Moon, in which the moon hatches a giant winged creature that lays a new moon egg and flies away into space. Of course, the episode isn't really about the creature. It's about how we as human beings react to something we don't understand, with violence or with hope. Because whether we look up and see the man in the moon or a monster says a lot about how we see ourselves. Across history and cultures, we've seen the moon as a reflection of ourselves, our fantastical dreams, our capacity for change, our love of cheese. Technological advancements have given us more accurate and detailed images of the moon, but they haven't dimmed our capacity for wonder. Just because we can see more clearly doesn't mean we can see everything. How we imagine life beyond our own world reflects what we value and how we show up as explorers. And that's important as we build a bigger human footprint on the moon. So which one of our stories will we choose to reflect? The ruthless capitalists? The imperfect souls seeking transformation? It's the next chapter in a long tale of life on the moon. And we're writing it right now. Thank you for watching. You can find me on Instagram and of course on PBS Monstrum. Please like, share, subscribe, and ring that notification bell like the hollow moon for more space for humans. Ruthusen. Ruthusen? Ruthusen. Ruthusen? Ruthusen? Grathausen. Grathausen? We'll just, I'll go with that.